decided that this was the music that I was going to make. Um, I just started writing some music for strings and piano and then I got interested in synthesizers and just started adding that into it because I liked it. You know, It was never this idea of being a pioneer or, or trying to stick out from the crowd or anything. Um, it was just what I liked and wanted to do. Nobody likes being stereotyped. Nobody likes being categorized. You're categorizing someone or describing them, you're sort of boxing them in as well. Some people say that it is a violent move. Iceland is such a small community and, and the music scene here is, is really small and tight and people are just really helpful and, and want to like creative and want to help one another in an artistic way. Because every single scene is so small that it all just became one scene. We actually live very close to each other. Very close to the end. Which might not be surprising because it's pretty small. <laughs> What happened basically is the American music industry had gotten an interest in Iceland, probably because uh, Sigurós had broken through, Björk was there. Like Iceland, I think, has always been rather easy to sell to the media because it's quirky, because it's foreign, because it, you know, it's different. So like writing a press release for an Icelandic band, you can, especially in the beginning, I mean, it's funny to read some of the initial interviews with the sugar cubes, they're all like, you know, these people eat puffins and like elves and glaciers and you know, eventually that becomes a cliche. So by the time Severos actually start making their mark on the world, that's like already kind of tired and they get annoyed if you ask them. But, you know, I mean, as members of the media, you know, when writing a press release or receiving a press release, it's much more likely to get uh, noticed if it has an angle. Right? I mean, that's uh, there's a thing like you have amputee sisters playing like rockabilly. Uh, with pornographic undertones like that's like what okay I want to check that out I want to write about that we have mixed feelings about this cliches about Icelandic music because on one hand it's not true um, but on the other hand having such a strong image as a music scene can really help us get out of here you know and go on tour internationally um, you know get record labels in other countries interested in what we do uh, because they think there's this ethereal vibe about Icelandic music that everyone is, you know, is mysterious and exciting. In the 90s, when it probably starts coming up, uh, and it's the Sugar Cubes and then Sigurós, uh, and all the bands around them, all the ones in orbit, uh, they are uh, a very, very cynical bunch. You know, it's Generation X. So they just took it with like, yeah, uh, you know, they made fun of it. They played with it. They like to lie to journalists, like Blue Eyed Nine. You know, it's like the biggest joke in Icelandic music. It's like some motherfucker described Severos as like, oh, it's God crying gold tears from heaven. I think like actually, but uh, I don't know. Like I don't know, maybe some Severos sounds like that. They're a really fucking good band. And then of course the next generation after Generation Y. One thing I started seeing bands actually actively started capitalizing on that uh, stereotype and like, oh, you want you want elves? All right, I'll give you elves. No problem. Do you have money? 
So I think uh, bands like Retro Stepson and Samaris and uh, a lot of these really promising young bands are very much overlooked because they don't fall under that stereotypical image of Icelandic music. And I think that makes, while it made my life a bit easier, um, it may have made their life a bit harder, having such preconceptions. Like, yeah, maybe it's annoying, but it's like annoying like a fly is annoying, which is not really, like, you know, ah, oh, oh, fly, oh, god damn it. Like, maybe, maybe, maybe a wasp would be annoying because you're afraid it will stab you or like, you know, hurt you, but a fly doesn't hurt you. It's just like buzzing and you're like, oh, you're like elves. You're like, oh, but you know, in general, it doesn't really, it's not consequential, I think. So we have a good uh, educational music system and I think that does definitely contribute to the amount of uh, musicians that grow up to actually be musicians. Um, and then when, when this sort of image, outside image gets created, I think it has a, a kind of a role, snowball effect that because we have this image of being very artistic and musical, we get more encouraged to be artists. It's not that many of us, you know, and, and uh, well, there's not, yeah, not that many of us that live here in Reykjavik and, and even fewer of us that are in the music scene and even fewer than that, that that are doing music for a living, you know, so if you're, if you're good, you know, if you're, if you're a good musician and something that you have, and music is something you have a passion about, you know, it's, it's quite natural that people start kind of working together, not like London or whatever, where, where there's, thousands of, of very good musicians. I think it's great. Um, we are kind of forced to collaborate with, with uh, musicians or artists who are doing, um, who are nothing like ourselves necessarily. But I think that's a big part of why the music scene here is so strong, is that we have had to open up. We have had to accept people who think in different ways than we do ourselves. Um, because, for example, I could be considered to be played neoclassical music or whatever you want to call it. Um, but there is no neoclassical scene. Because if there was, I would be like the only person in it with Johan Johansson. <laughs> and that's it, you know. So if I want to collaborate with someone, if I want to get a producer on my album, I was like, there would be one person I could call. And it wouldn't really get us anywhere in the end. Um, but because there is no scene for that, when I want to work with someone, I have to call someone who is from a, a different genre, like someone from the electronic scene. or Because uh, every single scene is so small that it all just became one scene. You know, it's just the music scene. And this has forced us to open our eyes to different things and, and grow and mix things that in the end create unique ideas. So most of the musicians are staying in, in Reykjavik and it's really, it's a, it's a small town, uh, although it's uh, 100 and maybe 180,000 people. Uh, so it's really, really easy to get to uh, one another. And, and yeah, we have a few clubs and, and a few places we can play at. And, and like just for myself, I've been in the music scene just for uh, about a year, I've been playing cl clubs in Reykjavik and, and, and in venues. Um, and you sort of just know every musician just after this few months being in the music scene because you're always like playing uh, before some band or after some band and, and some, you know, you're always, you're always meeting the same people. It tends to become a small little group and uh, everybody working with everybody, which is very good. It's, it makes, uh, also decreases the kind of competitiveness that you can feel in, in places like London and, and bigger places where yeah, people are always competing with each other and kind of dragging each other down, you know. Uh, here it, it's more like com collaboration than, than competition. 
The heart is the treasure for womankind. They're always controlled. They're always confined. Controlled by their parents until they are wives. Then slaves to their husbands for the rest of their lives. I've been a poor girl, my fortune is sad. I've always been courted by the wagoner's lad. He courted me daily by night and by day. But now his wagon is loaded, he's going away. But your parents don't like me because I am poor. They say I'm not worthy of entering your door. But I work for my living and my money is my own. So if they don't like me, they can leave me alone. Your horses are hungry, go feed them some hay. Come sit down beside me as long as you may. My horses ain't hungry, and they won't eat your hay. So fare thee well, darling, I'll be on my way. Your wagon needs greasing, your whip is to mend. Come sit down beside me as long as you can. My wagon is greasy. And my whip's in my hand So fare thee well, darling No longer to stand I guess there is a difference in the sound from bands depending where they're from in Iceland. I think bands from other towns in Iceland tend to be more straightforward, just rock and roll, or a little bit more typical, generous in a way, than than in Reykjavik, where we have this huge melting pot of all these different um, art types and, and music genres. We've had an unusual amount of uh, Eurovision entries from, from the small town of Dalvik, <laughs> which is a town of, I think, less than a thousand people. <laughs> I think I think maybe the thing is that in those, especially the remote towns, um, people grow up on music that is forced upon them in a way. Like there's the radio, there's the TV, and that's it. You know, bands don't go there on tour. Like no one plays Dalvik on their <laughs> international tour. Um, there's probably not a music shop in the town, you know. There, you might be able to get a couple of CDs at the supermarket, but that's only going to be Justin Bieber and, you know, whatever sells the very most. Um, so m most of the musicians that come out f from there will kind of follow these very straightforward mainstream guidelines of music. And we do have a big tradition for uh, music and art in, in our culture, like uh, our biggest pride of Iceland are the sagas, which consist of writing and poetry. And that poetry was sung, you know, they, they, they had special ways of singing this poetry. Um, we have the, the rhymes that, that are sung, which is very deep in our, our culture. Um, so when, when people are very young, um, it's like in England you get your parents sent you to football practice. Um, here it's just as common that the parents sent you to music education. Um, can you sing just one note? It's very simple. Disco. 
I think it's uh, intellectuality and sort of uh, a very young civil history, maybe just one, one century or something. So it's such a young culture. Thank you. I think it's freedom sort of to, to define yourself what Iceland music is. like you're in a family or something you know because because we're few and it's a, equipment can be hard to come by when you live in an island <laughs> so people have to sort of be prepared to help each other out you know because if we don't help each other out we can't really do it I toured with Moom for four years I think for yeah four or five years and then um, Kjartan from Seuros he produced my first record and co-produced the second and then I have a, a, a vocal entrance from Björk in one of my songs on the second on the second record so yeah it's all it's all quite tight together and then of course school is very soon my long yeah my long-term collaborator Town I, I, I grew up in is a, is a really small town of, 40, of only 40 people. I moved here when I was uh, about 10 years old. I had been in music school then for three years before. I spent a lot of time just alone playing guitar and, and listening to music. I formed my first band here when I was 11 with a few guys that I knew that were playing instruments. Like I knew one drummer, I knew one guitarist, I knew one bassist, so we just formed a group and, and we were at a similar age. There's not that much to do here actually. So we started this band and for the first years we were actually like playing in the garage just for six hours uh, like daily, just all the time. Just, uh, yeah, we didn't have that much else to do and that was our hobby and so uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the things that are, uh, is good about growing up in this small, small community. I don't get here as often uh, as I would uh, want, but I used to like when I moved from this place to Reykjavik uh, about five years ago, I I was really overwhelmed being in, in this uh, in this big city. So I had to come here every weekend, every weekend, and and just be in the peace and quiet. Thank mm -hmm. you.
you're with me in the dark Light my way at night Let your light shine now This burden weighs me down The heaviest of weights Knocks me to the Down to the jewel that sparkles on the ground. Blue mountains loom above. Blue mountains loom and I walk along one wish won't be forgotten. Like with this whole thing, if we if we talk about this project, I had never like expected this to uh, blow up like as it did, um, and I really didn't expect like releasing an album like a week before uh, we started recording the album. So 
uh, all the things that, that have been happening for the past year or two have been a big surprise to me and something I had never expected. When we were doing this album and we decided that we wanted to do it in uh, Icelandic, then uh, my father was sort of just the first name that came to mind. Um, because he has been like uh, writing poems just since he was just 10 years old or so. And he's 72 years old now. Uh, the first song we recorded uh, was a song called Sumargestur or uh, Summer Guest. And I just sent him a demo, emailed it to him. And just uh, a few hours later, he, he sent me a lyric um, in Icelandic. and. Yeah, we just thought it was perfect and we used it and we just kept going using the same method and the same process. And sometimes we talked about like the atmosphere of the song and how it re would relate to the lyric and stuff like that. But most of the times it was um, just a separate process. You know, I wrote the song and the melody and produced it and, and, he, and he wrote the lyric. This exhibition is uh, just a small collection of artwork connected to our albums, our videos. When we started thinking about it, how much artwork we had, it was endless. This is just like a small, what's being shown here is just a small portion of what we have. These pictures right here are three albums. These candles here, they're from Sing Along to Songs You Don't Know. Oh, smear the poison ivy. And this is from Smile Wound, our newest album. So these are like mixtures of it. We've always had a connection, you know, tried to put a lot of work into the album, artwork, and everything visually connected to what we do. This is from uh, actually Silla, from the band. She, how do you say it? Not knitting, Cro crochet. crochet. Mask that we used for our last video. She wanted to wear this. This is like a, her own skin. She wanted to wear it in the video, but she had to go to camp. <laughs> yeah. So we got this really like two meter tall guy to wear it instead. And it was really funny. I don't know. I have no idea why there's uh, so much good music. It's good, good energy here. And I think uh, people don't want to compete with each other in this particular music circle, but surprise each other. Everyone wants to do something surprising. So I think that's why it's quite eclectic and different between bands. I think it's a bit like this uh, exhibition. People are forced to work together or forced to be so close that they, you know, feel comfortable with working together. So, uh, like, you know, uh, you, you know, you, if you're not playing in another band, you are doing the artwork or you are mixing the album or you are carrying, the amps. carrying their amps or, or, you know, helping out in one or the other way. So it, 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 it's, I don't, like you said, there's a bit of a competition. I don't think there is. I don't know. No, we're not. There, there's not a traditional... London or, 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 or big city, big city atmosphere where you are kind of you know where there's where there's rivalry, you know the blur oasis of come on, we'll write a better sound than you guys. It's nothing like that. People are more like like I always said, surprising their friends. We were asked about the underground scene in, in Reykjavik yesterday, which is hilarious because that's just two people. I mean, the underground scene is just two guys listening to. <laughs> I think uh, Airwaves is a really good place to do things like this as well. Not only play music, but to try to do something fun. The development of the festival has been going kind of hand in hand with the, the, the development of the Icelandic music scene because, because it's uh, for the last five, like five, six years has been really, really good. There's been lots of really, really good music coming out of the scene and for some reason the festival has been getting better as well. It's kind of, yeah, it goes kind of hand in hand. 
course, it started in 1999 as a, I think the idea was to promote the band Gooskus in their new release. Uh, their single at the time was uh, Lady Shave, wonderful song. You know, its roots are as a showcase festival with the purpose of uh, signing Icelandic bands. But there was a contest in a local radio station. Uh, play for the international record business. I often make an effort to try and see Icelandic bands at Iceland Airways because I feel that at this festival they have prepared for like even more than usual. They've gone an extra mile because they're trying to impress some foreign journalists or something. Um, so they even put on a much better show than usual. So um, it's great to walk around and see all the local bands in front of these big foreign crowds. The first one I attended was in 2000, so I've been coming every year since 2000. I haven't missed the one, I believe. Uh, since 2004, I played it with my band Reykjavik with an exclamation mark. It's quite a nice band, you should check it out. Then, uh, in I think 2005 or 2006, I commenced working for the festival. And I worked for the festival for, I think, until 2009, I believe. And then, you know, uh, I started being a reporter for Grapevine. I have experienced it. I think from basically every angle, because I, you know, I love a music festival. I, I love music. I love meeting people, meeting bands, seeing new things that blow my mind, or new things that I think that suck. Maybe you know they also give you a new perspective on stuff. I will say in 2000, you know, I'm sure you've heard this before. It wasn't a multi-venue, uh, you know, five-day festival like it is now. There was no tradition of multi-venue festivals back then. Uh, that was how we did rock festival you know 2001 is a pivotal year in the festival's history and when it starts taking the shape that it currently has 9-11 happened and so nobody wanted to fly so those big acts didn't make it so instead they were like oh fuck I mean we like we still have like some people did make it and there were some structures that were like you know uh, they tried to say what they could so they God, there were like a few venues downtown and they just put on like long rock shows where bands took turns playing local bands a lot of great local bands and that was wonderful that was the, that was like the seeds of this like multi-venue festival if you will I've been playing every festival since 2006 so this is my eighth time and it's been kind of getting gradually better you know it's been every year it's it's always a little bit better like better organized than just like and more kind of tight. This year we have Kraftwerk, we have like a band like Fucked Up. Well, of the international acts, I, I'm really looking forward to see Yola Tango. I'm a, I'm a big Yola Tango fan. Well, last night I saw Omar Suleiman, which was really, really interesting and great. I love that show. Mark DiMarco. Omar Suleiman. Omar Suleiman. John Hopkins. I want to see this guy, Sean Nicholas Savage, who's from, who's from uh, Montreal. We are driving without friends. We are driving to a faraway I think I won't have time to see any of this, you know, it's usually I'm, I'm playing a lot, I'm playing like seven times and then I just try to go and see my friends, you know, see my friends in the other Icelandic bands just as much as I can. I'm gonna definitely gonna go see Moom, they're playing at Frikirkjan and uh, yeah, probably gonna see Hjaltalin as well, yeah, just most, most of the Icelandic bands I guess. This is more like a festival that's about discovery. For me, the best thing at this festival is just to wander around. You know, just go, because there's music pretty much everywhere. 
you just walk around and you just like find some something wonderful. My father is a musician, so uh, growing up I had a lot of like they, they, his band used to uh, rehearse in my living room and stuff like that. So I've always been around music since I was a, was a kid, but I didn't start playing music until I was about 16 or 17. Got my brother's guitar and just started playing like Nirvana songs and stuff like that and uh, formed a, a garage band with friends, you know, taught them how to play instruments. The studio has been uh, active for about three years or something like that. I, me and Gummi, who, who, uh, who Gummi, who's my, the bass player, moved into this space about a year and a half ago. Here there are bands Valdimar and Tilbury are in this space over here. And then this guy Bob Justman is over there. And uh, another band called Monotown are over there. It's, it's like yeah, these five, five main bands that are here. And, and also Hjaltalin. 
are rehearsing here when they when they do that. But I recorded this album with this guy Sindri, who's who, who's uh, who's the main guy in, in two, these two Icelandic bands, one called Sieper and the other called Sinfang. Uh, he he produced my my second album, my second solo album, which is called Winter Sun. And on that album, uh, Sole, who's a who's in uh, Sieper actually as well. She's a, she's a singer and piano player. She played piano on that album and. Uh, uh, Silla, who's who's now the singer in, in my band, who's also in Moom, she she sang on that one, and this guy Guðmundur Óskar, who's kind of my right hand man, he's the bassist in in Hjaltalín and uh, Tilbury and Borko and Monotown and a few other bands. This guy Maki, who's in uh, Amina and and Tilbury as well and uh, and Sinfang and, and bands, you know, it's, it's all the same people really, you know, but yeah. Earlier this year, there was an election where um, there was a complete overturn from the right, uh, from the left wing to the right wing. So the left wing was rather supportive. Uh, after the economic crash, they they realized that um, uh, one of the biggest things that were going to help Iceland out of this economic problem that we were having was the tourist industry. And why is the tourist industry booming? Because of the art industry. So they put more money into art to help promote Iceland. Like, why are they giving money to send bands on tour? It's because these bands become, become ambassadors of Iceland wherever they go. And, and this image of Icelandic music is so strong that people actually want to come here and discover more music. And, and, and that is it's a big part of our um, income, like currency income as a country. Um, so they gave us um, some more funding to music and then we had the elections earlier this year and the first thing that the right wing the new right wing government did was to strike all of that out again and the financial projections for next year they've cut out a lot of the support for music because the current government doesn't believe that pop music needs the funding even though they get it like hundredfold back for every krona they put into it they get like a hundred back you know um, so, um, we don't feel particularly uh, appreciated by the government, to be honest, at the moment. Um, and uh, a lot of these things, like um, we had the export fund for music, for example, um, that bands could apply from for to pay their travel costs, because we're on a fucking island, and if we want to go on tour, we have to pay for flights for the whole band and the whole crew, and this can be uh, a very difficult step, like first step to take when you're still playing very small shows. Um, so uh, there was this travel fund created for bands to like be able to go outside of Iceland and play their first shows. Um, the current government has struck that out of the uh, out of the bill. You know, because they, they, they support farmers, because farming is not um, self-supportive in a way, like um, everyone thinks it is, but actually most of their money comes from the government. Um, so the same argument doesn't seem to apply for farming and music, because they think seem to think that music is a hobby, it's not a real job. Well, if you're a farmer, you're a, you have a real job, you know. So... You know, even though it's exactly the same purpose of supporting farming, because you get actually more money back. You put money into it, and they create jobs. They create uh, a big industry which generates money. Um, music is actually the same. It's it's an economy in itself. Um, musicians always hate to admit it, but it's true. It's a business. We're creating a product in the end. And if you're a politician, you should maybe see it that way, and not just as some people's hobby who should actually just get a real job, you know, grow up and get a real job. <laughs> I also think that we are uh, a good enough music scene to be able to withstand what whatever idiots are in charge at any time, you know. <laughs> so it's okay. Um, I would love to see more support from the government, but I also think it's, it will do okay.